you want a triangle, I'm going up one side from the base to the apex of the triangle, have the word on the outside of the line, edification, and on the bottom line, underneath, comfort. What was the other one? Edification, comfort, and exhortation. That's right. And we have been teaching on the three vocal gifts of the Holy Ghost. Tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. Vocal because we speak them out in the local church. And one of the safeguards of these gifts is they must come within that triangle for the local church. In other words, the gifts must come within that triangle, either to comfort the church with an inspired utterance from God, or to edify the church spiritually in the spirit that brings blessing into the soul or comfort for those who may be coming to the meeting in need. Such things as guidance of will for your life and those kind of things, generally speaking, are outside of that triangle because that is a rare gift. That is not the gift of prophecy here, but it's the office of a prophet and they are rare indeed. And so when anybody gives guidance in a meeting, you know, going to the extreme, Mrs. Jones, you must now divorce your husband and marry Mrs. So-and-so. That's extreme, of course. But you've got to be very careful with that kind of a prophecy because it's direct in life. It could cause disaster. And unless that is truly of God, then you're in trouble. And so in the local church, everybody can prophesy, everybody can speak in tongues, everyone can interpret within that framework. And you can have a glorious time of blessing. It's to comfort, to build up, to edify. And last week, we referred to the chapter of Genesis where it says, God has made man in his image in the likeness of man. He made him so that man is a God. And because of sin is fallen. But when we are converted at the cross, we are restored back into that position of sons and daughters of God. And we become actually like God. And the whole purpose of salvation and the church and teaching is that we may grow in the image and the stature and the fullness of Christ. And all these gifts and the ministry are to build us into the image of Christ. You'll see again and again, as you read through that chapter on the gifts of the Spirit, that let all things be done decently and in order, and may it be done to edify, to build up the church. And we said that if we are made in the image of God, then we have amazing potential. The human mind, memory, what a marvelous thing that is. Imagination. We can imagine all kinds of things. We can enter into a world of fantasy in the natural. Even in the fallen state of man that don't know Christ, who've never been filled with the Holy Ghost. You can go and you can build a world of fantasy in your mind. You can go back to when you was a small child and remember all sorts of things. The human mind has tremendous capacity. And even in its fallen state, it's a marvelous thing. But in God, and redeemed and pure, and God using it, what potential? What could God reveal? And what could that mind reveal through the mouth to the other members of the church as God uses that mind if it's dedicated? The same with our hearing. What a marvelous thing is hearing. You know, I'm amazed when I think I love music. I was brought up in a family of musicians, all my family on my father's side were professional musicians and I love to bring illustrations about orchestras and bands and all the different instruments and all blending together and then all in accord with one another and sometimes they cross one another and discords purposely written so that it brings a certain effect in music and going you know double piano and double 40 and all the wonders of music and all the various sounds, the violin and the trumpet and the bass, the deep sounding instruments, the sweet sounding instruments, all in the orchestra and at the front, the conductor. And you know, when you think of hearing, how we can hear, we can pick out the trumpet, we can pick out the violin, we can pick out certain things in the music. 
What a marvellous thing, eerie. Hearing people converse and talk, the wonder of it. Now, in the fallen state, a man outside of God who may be a blasphemer, may be living a terrible life as regards the Christian view of life, and yet he can have a marvellous capacity to hear little children when they hear stories and how they listen and how the words into their ears build up a picture in their wonderful mind that God has made and you're talking about fairies or whatever you, you want to and they believe it because they're so simple and they build up this world of fantasy. Marvellous thing, communication. And the mouth, the various ways we speak and lift our voice or lower it down or be angry or be soft or be kind. All these things, these faculties belong to God. Our body, the arms and the legs and our emotions. And I would like to especially stress the amazing thing of the human spirit, the capacity of wonderful emotion. Made in the image of God. We have a potential to love as God loves. Not as the world loves. Not a physical attraction. Not something that's selfish. But a love that's willing to die for those who that love is centered on. Like Christ died upon the cross. To have the capacity to love like God. For God loves the whole world. That's why he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And God's anger. The amazing anger of God is described in Scripture symbolically because human words and ordinary words wouldn't describe it. It's described sometimes as a burning fire. Our God is a blazing fire, a raging fire. Thunders and lightnings describes the judgments of God. God can be very, very angry. And anger is not wrong if it's child. We should be angry against injustice. We should be angry. You see what I'm trying to build up? Our emotions are so vital. Now then, let's get down to the study tonight. I think emotions possibly are as important as any other faculties because, you see, in the emotion, our spirit is centered. The very spirit within us the part of us that will live eternally. The body may be dying, but the soul is eternal. Uh, that has a capacity to love. In the natural realm, love a man or a woman. So much so that they're willing to vow and live together and bring up children. And that's a wonderful thing if it's done in God. Or a, a capacity to have mercy or compassion. Or be used of God in some act of justice. Angry against things that are wrong and people who are being exploited. The emotions of the spirit are so important. And you see, I'd like to think of the emotions tonight as the springboard for the gifts of the spirit. Surely they must be. Love is the greatest thing there is, and that's an emotional thing. And I hear people speak in a cold way, and they talk about Meetings like Billy Graham or exciting meetings or when people dance or they sing or they clap and they say, oh, it's all emotion. Well, what's wrong with emotion? They get emotional at a football match. i never seen so much emotion as there was in the World Cup. But if in church, sometimes you get emotional or they're overboard, you know, I mean, they go to extreme, they climb up the walls, they hang on the candle fix, you know, they, they, they stretch it to the full. Well, what's wrong with emotion? I'm full of emotion. I may control it, but we've all got emotions, and that is the very centre of our life. No wonder the devil doesn't want us to be emotional. We'll be all cold slabs of stone in the church and shake hands with hands like cold pieces of cod, won't we, instead of having a loving, warm relationship. Nothing wrong with emotions. Now, what I want to do tonight is centre on that, because I believe emotions are the springboard, the inspiration from which the gifts can operate. A little example, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and I'm dedicated to God and my whole life is in his hands. I want to live for him, I'm sanctified. And in the meeting, I feel a sudden great surge in compassion move into my heart and it's above the normal and I'm channeled in God and I want to be a blessing to the meeting. And I think, what is this? And coming up with this tremendous compassion, I feel it, and I think it's so great I can't really express it. 
depending on the measure of the emotion that God may be giving me or that I may be experiencing. And I think to myself, I wonder if God's wanting me to operate the gift of the Spirit here. And so I look up to God and maybe I'll get a word from God. It may be just a, a word of scripture. And I stand up in the meeting and with a clear voice so that everybody can hear. I let that emotion come out. I'm centered. I'm sacrificial. I'm living in God. I, I'm wholly his. And I want his spirit to take all of that because he's engineered it. He's inspired it. I'm a son of God. I belong to God. My spirit belongs to God. Christ is in me. I am in Christ. The Holy Ghost is in me. And I'm in the Holy Ghost. And I'm in the meeting and the church wants comfort. It wants edification. It wants instruction. It wants to be built up. And I feel this. So I stand up. The meeting may be dead. And perhaps nobody can pray. Perhaps they're tired. They need something to help them. And I feel this. So I stand up in the meeting. And I've asked God. And he's given me at the start of perhaps some scripture. And so I don't know any more than that. I've got to move in faith now. But I've got the surge in emotion of compassion. And then the word of scripture. And then I speak it out in the, in the, in the spirit of the emotion. When Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. And the eternal love of God came into his heart and moved up and moved into his hands. And there the lame and the blind and the crippled were waiting. And he touched them and they were healed. And tonight he is here. Rise up and let him touch you tonight. You with a broken heart. And, and the words are coming from God. You're not thinking of them. See, when you operate a gift of the Spirit, if it's pure, it's not human. It's God. And you've got to be so crucified with Christ, so living to God, that your emotion that God uses comes up and then you hand it to God and he takes hold of it. And now it gets filled with the emotion of God and of Christ. And he gives you a scripture to start with. You've no more than that. Now you've got to step out in faith. It's no good sitting there and waiting to see what the whole thing is. You've got to stand up and be prepared if no more comes to sit down again and make a fool of yourself. But it never does, you know. Because as you begin, you suddenly feel the anointing upon you. And you feel the meeting become still. And all the tired minds become alive. And people are listening, ears are open. And all those wonderful faculties that all the members of the church have, God's moving in them all because he wants them to have a blessing. And so we start off. And as we start, we're just feeling for the words and they may come in our mind or they may come in our lips or they may come through our emotions or we may speak what we feel. But we just move in God. And when God ceases, we cease. Now, you, you've no need to worry about standing up. Because you won't make a fool of yourself. If I only got the first part of that, and I thought, yes, I feel this great emotion. Lord, it's, it's wonderful. And I believe you want to bless the church. Now, how can I start? And I get the scripture, it comes into my mind, and Jesus saw the multitudes and was moved with compassion. So I say, that's enough. I stand up in faith. I don't know what else is coming. And I say, and when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion and I find I've no more and so I, I just wait a minute and I say blessed be the name of the Lord he'll move here tonight and I sit down I've not made a fool of myself have I I may have added a bit of the human but it doesn't matter now anyone can operate the gifts if they understand them you know what we do we put them so high above us into the supernatural realm and we put ourselves so far down on the earth in the flesh because most of the time we live in the flesh we, we're not spiritual enough to be always in the spirit and when we get in the meeting we seem to think we need to have Gabriel come down from heaven and show us a blinding light before we speak or something but you see the gifts are very normal God doesn't want to frighten us he doesn't want to do such things that we're all afraid. And dear Mrs. Jones, who's 80 odd or 90, and comes along and doesn't know much about things of the Spirit and be frightened to death. God wants to comfort. He wants to build up. He wants to edify. And so we can move, every one of us can move into that realm, even the simplest person, if they're willing to go in faith. Isn't that wonderful? Now, I'd like to take you to a scripture, chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. 
And if you didn't remember those words to put at the side of your triangle, they're in verse 3. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. And all the gifts must operate in that realm in the local church. But I want to come to the control of the gifts now. And we're going to start reading at verse 5. And I'm going to take this verse, and I want you to listen to it. It's all about the emotions, really. I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpreteth that the church may receive edifying. He says, I would rather, I would that you all spake in tongues. But rather that you prophesied, rather that you spoke the normal language that people understand, their native tongue. Because then they can understand, they can be built up in the faith. And then I want to move on to verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, that all things be done unto edify. And there's that word again. It must come within that framework of comfort, edification, and exhortation to build up the saints. But notice the thing it says, a psalm, that singing, that's an emotional exercise. When you sing, it stirs your emotions. It stirs them more than speaking generally. Hath the doctrine, that's teaching, so that when you speak out, you're teaching the people. That example I give you about compassion, you're teaching through the gift of the Spirit, compassion of Christ. And if it's truly of God, people will catch that spirit of compassion. It won't be just going in their ears and then forgetting, or knowledge in their head that they can store up and they say, I know what that means. But the real work is in the Spirit. They receive, or should receive, in the Spirit, a portion of compassion. You know, I pray every day, give me a fresh supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So the gift should minister not just to the mind, that's only a vehicle to the soul. And not just through the ears, but it should speak to the Spirit itself. It should build the Spirit. If it doesn't do that, it's all head knowledge. And you go away the same as you came, dead. And you know what's wrong with the church today? The trouble with the church today, it's not in reality spiritual. It's all on the natural plane. Very good messages. Very exact doctrine. Lovely choruses, singing, clapping, dancing, all outward. And I love that you shake hands and love your brother and you say all the right things. But there's something missing in the soul. Is that right? Or am I different than other people? Now, if you get a, a spiritual meeting where God has ministered to the spirit and you feel the real compassion of Christ, not just in your head, but deep in the spirit, you know, at the end of that meeting, you're going to be filled with compassion. And when you talk to your brother, you don't have to say much at all. There's a spirit of unity. That's how you can tell when God's ministering or has ministered in a church. There's a liberty in the spirit. Not a liberty in the flesh. You see, people call liberty dancing. That's liberty. They call clapping liberty. That's liberty. They free them to worship. That's liberty. But it's fleshly liberty. It's human liberty. It's liberty of the body, which is only the temple. It's only the case. It's not the liberty of the spirit. You can do all that and your spirit can be bound. It can all be formal, not reality. One part of you is doing that, the other part is as dead as a doornail. And you're tired and it's hard holding your hands up. And you say, I wonder if I can sit down in the middle of it. You're all sorts of things going, it's not spiritual at all. And that's a dead letter and that'll kill. But if it's spiritual, oh, miracles can happen. The blind can see. Love can flow. Compassion can move. You see, the gifts of the Spirit, people say, oh, these are lesser gifts. They're very, very powerful gifts. And God's made them free to the church. Miracles are rare. Healings may be a little rare. Birds of knowledge may be rare. But you know, they're only needed on certain occasions. Perhaps in evangelistic meeting. But in the church, we can have 
perhaps the greatest gifts of all, to edify, to build up one another in Christ. Do you think that's tremendous? I think it's amazing. And all these things that it says here, another has an interpretation of a tongue. Somebody speaks in a tongue in the meeting. Now, you know, people say to me, when do I speak in tongues? I've never spoken in tongues. I'm afraid to speak in tongues. How do I know whether it's the flesh? All kinds of arguments. Well, you'll never speak in tongues. God's give you a gift. And you're a child. And if you're living to God and you're being instructed right, you know, people think if the meeting's all excited, there's been a tremendous word and everybody's emotionally lifted up and they're all on a high and they're all praising God. Oh, this is the time for a tongue. And this whole thing. You don't need a tongue then. You're being blessed. You're wasting it. You're being edified. What do you want a tongue for? You're enjoying it. You're rejoicing. You're being blessed. You know, the time to operate the gifts is when the meetings are dead. When there's no life. In the prayer meeting, when there's no big crowds, you know, and all the Sunday worshippers are not there, only the real ones who mean business. And they come tired, and they come because they're determined to pray whatever they feel like. And they get in the meeting, they're tired out, and they're worn out, but they love the Lord. And they know they should pray, so they come and they pray, and it's hard work, but they pray. Despite the hard work, they're diligent, and they're faithful, and they pray. And the meeting's hard, and you feel it's hard, but you still pray, and God honours that. But that's the time. If you feel the deadness in the meeting or you feel tiredness in the meeting, that's the time to operate a gift. Oh, I've seen the meetings lit up and lightened by the Spirit of God many, many times. We used to have three prayer meetings on a Friday night at my church when I was pastoring. And we used to have one at 8 o'clock till 9, and one at 9 o'clock till 10, and one at 10 o'clock till 11. This allowed all sorts of people to come, people who were on shift work, people who couldn't get to the first meeting and so on. And all round in that night, we'd probably reach 80, 90 or more people. And they used to come together. And sometimes they'd come straight off shift work. They'd be tired out. Or they'd be going on work and they were tired. And, you know, the meeting would be dead. And then some gift would operate, you know. And everybody forgets the tiredness and, and they lift up. And the quality of the gifts was good because we had good instruction from the Word. And it was good. We used to get lots of good gifts and they lift you up. And you go to work singing and praising God and quickened by the Spirit of God. And we need those gifts. And so, you see, all these are revelation. Just imagine, we can have a revelation from God, something that we've never had before. I don't know about you, but when I'm in the Spirit, in private or in the meeting, and you never even thought of something, and you'll move in the Spirit in a gift, and you'll find you're revealing something that you didn't ever realize. You, you're saying something that you'd never learned naturally. And then you say, oh, that's a mouse. I'm going to preach on that someday. You know, I've preached on many things that God's operated in the gifts of the Spirit. You know, today I was a little bit tired and I thought, I want to prepare for the meeting, Lord, but I never prepare on the actual day. I always prepare three or four days before, and then I have a couple of days where I don't do anything, only relaxing God, so that you come fresh, you know. And this afternoon I got up and I finished preparing. I'd done all my background, you know. No inspiration without perspiration. And I'd done all the perspiration and the hard work and the meditating and thinking and studying and weighing it up. And I left it for two days. And of course, what I always do is just try to build my spirit up. And I felt so tired, I felt so dead. I thought, the meeting tonight, if I go like this, Lord, it will, it will carry nothing. And you know, I, I just started to speak in tongues, and then I started to sing in tongues, and then I started to sing a verse of a hymn, and halfway through the verse, I'd speak back in tongues. And you know, in, in about 10 minutes, oh, I, the spirit was flowing, and I was feeling I couldn't get here quick enough. Because it edifies, it reveals things. It comforts. And so we could have a marvellous experience in the church, a new move of the Spirit. And I want to tell you something. This is the way to revival. It's not just a playing about. This is where the saints get built up and get spiritual. The three vocal gifts. I remember a church in Birmingham, and uh, Pastor Smith will know it, Ockley. I used to go regularly with Pastor Williams. It was a great church. Not another church like it in England, you know, but it was a great church. And they had their own way of doing things. But I'll tell you, when you got in that meeting, there was all sorts going. 
all sorts of gifts and all sorts of things happening. And they used to sing as well. You know, you don't hear a lot of that now, but instead of just giving a tongue, they used to sing in tongues, you know. I read of his hand, oh, miles, I read of his hand, oh, miles, I read of his hand, oh, miles, I read of his Then so I'll interpret it. God is good and my feet are dancing. Oh, it was terrific. You know, there's nobody falling asleep. And you hear sometimes such stereotype things in tongues, you don't, the same words over and over again, and then some of them gives a lot of scripture and you don't feel you've got anything, do you? Because it's natural. Not all of it. You have to judge that. But this church was tremendous. I always got a blessing. They used to dance and do all sorts. I'll tell you a story. Oh, you'll laugh, I'm sure. Miss Fisher, she was a tremendous woman. And the other one, but Miss Fisher was a kind of a, I don't know what you'd call it, she was an Amazon. Wasn't too big, but my goodness, she'd take on the world, she would. She'd fight the lot. She'd take on the devil and all the demons and all hell. She, ooh, she was a real fighter. She was a great woman. And she used to tell the young people where to get off. You know, they come out of a spiritual meeting, stand at the door, stand again. She said, what are you doing like that when you've been in a spiritual meeting? Go and have a prayer together. You know, she was right on the mark. Anywhere near the church building and the holy ground. Oh, my goodness, that's right. Save that for the country lane. You're here in presence of God. Praise his name. And uh, they had the men sit on one side and the women another. I'm not saying I say you should do that, but that was their way. But I'll tell you a, a, an amazing story. There was a man going around all the churches, and he was one of these chaps, you know, that thought he was going to put all the church right. He thought he was a real prophet. And he was going around all the churches, and every church he, he went in, he was bringing thunder and brimstone and the judgments of God, you know. There was not an atom of love in it, and there was nothing of God in it. It was him. But he didn't know it. And he thought he was doing God a service. And he was smashing churches up and causing havoc, you know. Anyway, they'd heard about this. But uh, <laughs> one Sunday morning, they had a big church, you know, packed out. And one Sunday morning, they didn't know the man. But this man came in. And he sat about halfway down. And halfway through the meeting, he stood up and he started in a loud voice. He was just about to sit out to condemn everything. And Miss Fisher says, the spirit came upon me, brother. She says, a man went out like that, and my fist was clenched. She says, and the Holy Ghost got in my legs, and I started to run off the platform. She says, and my eyes were closed, and I ran straight at him and hit him on the chin. She says, and he fell backwards on the pew. And she says, and then he jumped up, and he ran out, and he said, the sister on the back row gave him a kick up the bottom and says, Hallelujah. She says, we've never seen him since. Well, you can say what you like, but that, to me, that's Holy Ghost. There was no prim and proper, you know. Now, brother, now that, now that. You know, none of that. Holy Ghost. And they were ordinary people. <laughs> they were ordinary people, you see. And God doesn't want us to be what we're not. That's hypocrisy, isn't it? There's a tremendous lot of hypocrisy in the church. I'm sure Jesus would be saying to a lot of us, you know, woe unto you Pharisees. Blind leaders of the blind. Outward you're like white is sepulchres and inward you're full of dead men's bones. And that's right. And there's no revival. You know, we're talking about the church in victory and revival. And the world's going to pieces and our country's going to pieces. And we're not even touching them. And I don't see any real miracles today, do you? And where's the sinners? I remember a time in our church after being on television when every week we're having 50 to 100 sinners saved. Every week, from all over, and Holland and everywhere. And God was moving in the power of God, and the blind were seeing, and the deaf were hearing. And it was nothing formal about it, praise God. That's what we want, isn't it? <laughs> I'm getting excited. My goodness, God help us if we don't get excited about this kind of stuff. When I read the rubbish that's coming over by intellectual people on the television, and when I hear the politicians with all the duplications and all the... Oh, my goodness, give me the word. Let me keep separate. Not of the world. Hallelujah. Are you happy you're here? Amen. You don't want a telly coming in, do you? You don't want to turn the telly on? Oh, I thought you wouldn't. Praise the Lord. But, you know, emotion is so important. I'll tell you another mistake they make. They come in and they've set what the meeting's going to be before they start. They're going to do it. Different styles, some churches, it's very formal, very slow, very nice, very ordered. Nothing ever happens. Other churches, it's all excitement, all joy, all dancing, and all praising God, and they're the ones that are there. There's no difference between them. It's the spirit. 
It doesn't matter whether you dance or whether you're quiet. It doesn't matter whether you're jumping or whether you're crying. It doesn't matter whether you lay on the floor in prostration and helplessness and broken and absolutely humble before God, or whether you're jumping with joy at something, it doesn't matter. And the spirit isn't confined. I go into church and, oh, we've got liberty here. We'll live liberty every week. It never changes. Well, that's not liberty to me. It's stagnation. Praise the Lord. Don't you believe that, Bob? That's right. Yeah. I had a good time in prayer today, and it's all coming out. Spirit. Instead of all up here and all nice and, you know, praise the Lord. When we come together and sing choruses, that's not a formality. That's not just part of the service to get everybody in the meeting. That's not what it's for at all. What it's for, it's so we can get to worship God. So that our emotions can move. I don't know about you, but after I've been in a meeting, I was telling my daughter, Christine, here, she's there, she's the youngest, she's got four children, she's lovely, she loves the Lord. But, you know, when we sing the chorus, I was saying to Christine, uh, now they've got these overhead projectors. Now, I'm not criticised, I'm not against them, they're good, it's fine. But I find, for me, I don't remember the words the same as I used to. When I used to be taught the choruses, I used to remember the words more. Now, I'm getting lazy. I look at that. I don't need to bother learning them, so I just sing them, you see. Now, I get a blessing from them. Don't get me wrong. But, you see, I like, I don't know about you, I like to still be singing choruses when I've left the church. I like to sing them on the way home. I like to sing them in my car. I like to sing them in the butcher's shop. I like to sing them in my mind in a crowd, and they don't know. I like to sing them all the time. Because I want to build up spiritually. And I've only got a short time on earth. And I want to build up quick. So I can do something useful for God. You know, and all this week there's a lovely chorus been going through my mind. And I know it's beautiful. And I get all the feeling of it because I've sang it on the overhead projector. And it goes something like this. I love you, Lord. Because you first loved me. You know, and I thought, oh, that's tremendous. Do you know that one? And I couldn't remember the rest of it. So I keep singing that over and over again. It does the job. It does the job. I don't have to know all the words, really, as long as my heart's right. I love you, Lord, because you first loved me. Praise the Lord. Put the gears in. I love you, Lord, because you first loved me. Half a pound of tripe. I love you, Lord, because you first loved me. And six sausages. If you're spiritual, there's nothing unclean. There's nothing carnal. God gave the food to eat. Thank you for the sausages. They look good. Praise the Lord. I love you, Lord. Now, you see, when you come to the meetings, you've been practicing all week. So when it appears on there and you stand up, whatever others are doing, you're lost. Oh, you've got the worst now. I love you, Lord, because you first loved me. And you really get it. I love to sing the choruses. But you see, what it does, my emotions have been built up, ready for the gifts of the Spirit to move. Amen. Many times when I'm in my private prayer and I sing to the Lord, I sing in tongues, I sing in the Spirit, I sing psalms, I sing hymns. I've got about five favourite hymns and I'm singing them all the time and I think God loves them. Although he must have heard them thousands of times, but I think he loves them. O thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire to impart, kindle a flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart. There let it for thy glory burn with inextinguishable blaze and trembling to its source return in humble prayer and fervent praise. And I sing those hymns. I think I sing them every day. There's five of them. Give me the faith that can renew a mountain to a plain. And I can see the miracles happening. I one day I'll pray for the sick. 
and I'll have the faith to move them out. You see, people come and pray for the sick, and all week they can't. And if in any church you're going to have the gifts operate, you must be living the life. You don't just turn it on like a tap. Oh, I'll operate the gifts of tongue now. Bam, 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 bam. And everybody sits there and says, so it sounds like a machine gun. If I'm overcritical, forgive me, but I'm zealous for God. I've tasted something. I know there's far more in the eternal realms of the Spirit of God. I've tasted enough to hunger and thirst after it. I want more of it. I want to see it operating more. I want to communicate it to others. I want to see a revival in God's church. I want to see every child of God utterly God's. And then we'll see a revival. We'll start at the church. And God will soon send the people in once we get in that place. Because when they enter in, they'll say, God is in this place. This is the very gate of heaven. That's what they'll say. There's other scriptures to back up all I'm saying, you know, if you look in Ephesians 5 and 19. And this Colossians 3, you'll read there about singing and praying in the spirit. Speaking in hymns and psalms and spiritual songs. Do you know that chorus? Be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in hymns and songs. And spiritual songs. You know that one? Making melody in your heart to the Lord. Notice, in your heart. Privately. It's all right, you're not going crazy. You're doing the best thing on earth. You're worshipping God with the gifts of the Spirit. Oh, my. Some people get baptised in the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues, and then they never speak in tongues again. What a tragedy. What a work the devil's done. He's cut them off from blessing after blessing. I don't know about you. It's not always easy to start speaking in tongues or worshipping in tongues. But once you start, they get moving. It's amazing. And I don't stick to them, do you? I like to move around because I think God's a God of variety. You know, in my private prayers, I might start off with tongues. Slide to prayer, or preach to the pen. I see the prayer, oh, lend the prayer, O thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire to impart. I let the booty care, oh, shimba, poor, I'm enjoying myself in God. I'm being edified in God. My emotions are moving in God. I'm free in God. I'm not tied down to a routine. Don't you find prayers sometimes are so routine, you know? Please, Lord, bless that. Bless this. Do that. Heal this. Do that. God knows all about it. Now, I don't say we shouldn't pray. We should. There's a time for that. But surely there's a time to work. It's in the scripture. Your prayer life will take on a new dimension if you can get this. You'll want to run to prayer. I said to Christine's little boy today, he was coming up, he follows me around, you know, and he likes to talk with me. I said, I'm going for prayer now. I'm going for prayer now. How long, Grandpa? An hour. Don't disturb me. Right, old Grandpa. He's a great little lad. He's spiritual, isn't he? Great. Praise the Lord. Now, <clears throat> let's move on. Because I think this is important, the control of the gifts. Verse 29, let the prophets speak two or three and let the others judge. And it says in verse 27, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course and let one interpret. Now, if you read that, Churches, all kinds of churches, good churches, have all kinds of different interpretations of those scriptures. Control of the gifts in the church. Now, I don't know what your particular church teaches or what you think. But uh, perhaps at first glance, one would say that only three gifts should operate in any one meeting. Either tongues and interpretation. Somebody speaks in tongues, it's interpreted. Speaking tongues again, interpreted. Speaking tongues again interpreted. And some would say, now that is all you have in a meeting. Or three prophecies in a meeting. You don't need an interpretation because it's in our natural tongue. And some say, well, it should only be three gifts, either three interpretation of tongues or three prophecies. But then you see there are others that are saying, oh no, it means you can have three prophecies or three interpretations and tongues. It means six. 
And then others will say in verse 34, you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. Some say, oh no, you can have as many gifts as you like. Now you'd have a job to prove which one is the correct one. And whenever the scripture is ambiguous or seems to be ambiguous, whenever God seems to cloud it, then there's a reason, isn't there? He's very clear about some things, but on some things he's not. Church government's not too clear. And so churches have different kinds of government. Why is that? Because God is aligned for all kinds of circumstances, all kinds of communities. Now he doesn't have to do that with holiness, does he? Holiness is holiness. But with church government and all kinds of things like this and the gifts. So you've got all kinds of you. Now the church that I gave an illustration from in Ockley, Birmingham, they just let the gifts go as many as they liked. And it was a great blessing, believe me. And I know others that have different views. Now in our church, we always said that if you get three gifts in your main meeting, that's plenty to think about. If God is really speaking, if it is from God, you're only going to get confused if you have a lot of gifts. If God speaks, and he speaks three times, I mean, he may only speak once, an interpretation or a tongue or a prophecy. And that may be enough for that meeting. It may be a very powerful thing. On the other hand, if God speaks three times, it says at the most three, then surely there must be a lot to think about if it's from God, mustn't there? And not to rush off into some other prophecy and everybody doing that. And that's what we had in our main meeting where there was a great crowd. But then, you see, you've got a problem. How do people who have just been filled with the Holy Ghost, how do they learn to speak in tongues? I think you'll find out that in most churches, there's just about three or four, maybe five of, at the most or so, who operate the gifts. But you see, it says that they all may prophesy one by one. I believe if we're filled with the Holy Ghost, we can all be a contribution. And I think we miss a lot when we think that there's some of the simple people who come up with a very simple little thing. I think that might be the most godly of them all, perhaps the most spiritual. God can speak through those people. Now, how do you accommodate those people? Well, I believe that the scripture gives us plenty of room to maneuver. In a big meeting, you don't want more than three. Because you wouldn't get the word, it'd be all that, and you wouldn't know what you'd got. But three good prophecies, or tongues and interpretation in a main meeting is plenty. But then, when you're meeting as a little gathering together, like this for instance, I believe that everyone can have a go, and you can learn. In fact, we used to practice, has that surprised you? We used to practice this. Now, don't, don't worry whether it's carnal, whether it's your mind, whatever it is, don't worry. You've got to learn. How do you learn? How does a man learn to play football if he never kicks a ball? How does he learn? He doesn't become a professional by walking on the field among professionals. He has to start learning to play. It'd be no good on the field because it's not the real thing. It's just the basic things. Now, how are you going to learn to give a vision if you've never had the opportunity to give one? And you've never had any experience of doing it. So there's got to be some way of doing it. And I used to get in our church, I used to say to them, I used to get them all together and I'd say, now, I'd teach them first on how the gifts come. And then I'd say, now, we're going to have a time together. If you want to speak in tongues, speak in a tongue. And if anyone gets the interpretation, you get a word in your mind, you get a vision, you get an emotional feeling, and you get the thing from God, interpret it. Never mind whether it's of God. Never mind whether it's in the flesh. Is that right? You know what the Bible says? Let the others judge. You see, people say, oh, I daren't, brother. They're so spiritual, you know, these people. They're so spiritual. They say, oh, I daren't speak in tongues, brother. It might be in the flesh. And I'm always in the flesh. I've got to keep it under all the time. And how do I know it's of God? Well, you don't. You never know until you speak. And I'll tell you something else. It'll be very fortunate if you speak a pure word from God without a little bit of you in it. Or even a little bit of the devil in it. But you don't worry about that. You see, if you're thinking about that, the devil will play havoc with you. Because as soon as you say, oh, I feel I've got something. I feel this love in my heart. I've got the word. Jesus saw the multitude. And yeah, I think. And the devil says, in the flesh. 
You know that scripture. You know you're an emotional person. It's in the flesh. Let someone else do. And the opportunity goes, you see. I say, forget all that. Have a go, Joe. Step out in faith. Faith doesn't reason. Faith doesn't think. Faith steps out. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You've got to start moving. And if you've got to close it nicely and round it and you've nothing else to sit down, you might have spoke a very profound word for all you know. And you've no need to worry. Because if the church is taught right, we don't accept everything as infallible. If somebody gets up here and gives a prophecy tonight, I'm not going to accept that as infallible. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to judge it. Now, I don't judge it critically. I judge it by the word. If somebody says something here that goes against the word, or the spirit is wrong, or it's a wrong spirit, I can feel the spirit of it, I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to say it's not of God, but I'm not going to have it. I'm, I'm going to wait and see. Judge it. Now, you don't go around saying, brother, that was in the flesh. You'll stop everyone doing it. You just keep it to yourself. You're understanding with children, we learn it. Do you follow me? People go around and they say, oh, you were in the flesh. Well, let it be in the flesh. We're judging it. It doesn't affect us. We know where it's from. They're only learning anyway. You don't discourage your children when they're doing things and make a few mistakes, do you? And so you learn. Now, we don't say that's spiritual. We're not saying that's from God. But there'll be something of God in it. And slowly but surely, they'll develop and they'll grow. And then you'll begin to really operate with good, sound leadership and working together, tremendous things can happen. So, I've done that. And I think it'd be a good idea if we did it sometime, after we've had a little bit more instruction. And you'd get a blessing, you know. You'd be running to the prayer meetings. You know, I, I remember times when our young people, young ones, uh, 9, 12 and so on, they'd been saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, been through the waters, and they were meeting. And you know what they were meeting for? Not for games, you know. Not for the gang of seven or treasure hunts, to pray and to prophesy. And they were taught, like I'm telling you now. And you know, they were tremendous, these youngsters. They'd get up and give visions and prophesy, and they couldn't wait to get to the meetings. They were on fire with God. And we think we've got to entertain them. I'll tell you, spiritually, they can be as wise as the oldest member of your church. That's the kingdom, unless you'd be like a little child. And if you teach them right, they're going to be strong. Praise God. So all may prophesy one by one. And then I'll just close now. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. See, I've heard so many people say, Oh, brother, I just had to speak in tongues. The anointing was upon me. You don't have to speak in tongues at all. I owe back many, many, many times when I've had a real word from God, I believe. But I don't always give it. You see, when that means that the, the spirit of the prophet, the spirit of the one who gives tongues, the spirit of the interpreter, it's subject to him. He has control of it. One thing about God, he never takes away our will. The devil does. If you want to do something for the devil, you've got to go in a trance and you don't even know what's happening and you feel weak and worn out after because he takes possession and he says all sorts and you have no part in it. But with God... You have a free will. The Holy Ghost will never operate without your willingness. That's why people don't speak in tongues. That's why they don't step out. He doesn't take over. But once you step out and he works with you, then he works with you. And when you stop, he'll stop. And if you don't give it, he, he won't force you to give it. And that brings control. You have complete control of the gifts. I remember a brother who came to our church and he wasn't a member. And he was a very forceful personality. A lovely brother. He loved the Lord, but a bit extreme and unteachable. He was a good brother. He had a fervent, zealous spirit and he'd win souls. But really, he wasn't much good to the church. He was his own man. He wouldn't take any instruction. He knew what he wanted. He was God's man. And he used to come to our church occasionally. And we had a big church. And... He came to me once and talked to me in the vestry, just about 10 minutes before the meeting, and I'd been praying three or four hours. I got a word from God, and I knew it was from God. And this man walks in, can I come in? You should never go to your pastor 10 minutes before the meeting. He's been praying four hours to get to that place to speak, or perhaps whatever it is, he's ready, and you come in and get him on a carnal level. That's all wrong. If you want to see him, wait till after the meeting. He knocks on the door, he comes in. I says, I'm just going into me. Oh, yeah, but I want to tell you, it's very, very important. God spoke to me. Oh, yes, what is it? He says, God's told me I've got to preach here tonight. 
I says, has he? He said, yes. He says, well, I'm preaching. He says, make no mistake about that. I'm going to preach tonight. I've been praying four hours and I've got a word from God. Well, I've got a word from God. And listen, you've got to let me preach. If you don't, I'll disobey God. I says, don't worry. Don't worry. Brother, all your responsibilities have been passed on to me. I'll take God's judgment. You're not preaching tonight. I'm preaching. Oh, you can't do that. I says, I'm doing it. That's the kind of man he was. And then he used to come into meetings and... Every single meeting, he'd operate three gifts. Prophecy. Every meeting. Now, in the main meeting, we only allowed three. So my own members, who were tithing, giving to the Lord, getting all the instruction how to operate the gifts to bring a blessing. And here was a stranger who never came to the meetings, never tithed, wasn't a member of the church, wasn't loyal, coming in and having his own little fling in a big church and enjoying the blessing, you see. And so I call him aside again. Two or three times, I said, you're not going to speak in tongues or interpret in our church for at least three months. Oh, he said, you can't do that. I said, I'm doing it. And I said what I've said to you. Well, I told him, I forbid him to speak in tongues or interpret in the church for those reasons. And I believe I was right. We had a big convention. We had an international speaker. And he made a very special effort to get to our meeting. It was very well known. The church was packed out. And he had to get a train, I think at quarter to nine. So I was putting him on early so that he could preach and get off. He made a special effort to be there because I knew him and he wanted to help me. And he was a great preacher. And so I wanted him to get on, you see. And the place was packed with people from other churches. Of course, they didn't know all the private things I'd had with this particular brother. Sure enough... I says, now, Pastor so-and-so is going to preach. Sure enough, up he stands with a great... And he had a terrific voice. I'm not kidding. It used to lift the roof off. Oh, he's just going to start off. And I says, hold on. And I stopped the meeting. And God was on it. He stopped. I says, you've not got to prophesy or preach in this church, brother. Oh, and all the people that looked at me, you know, I was the arch villain. I says, you're not doing it. So he went off again. So I says, stop doing that. And I'd like you to leave. Well, you could have heard a pin drop. Convention, big speaker, all the people looking at me. What a terrible man he is. But I didn't care because God was looking as well. And he preached the word and he said to me after, he says, I'm glad you did that. He says, I wish more of our pastors would do it. You see, the gifts are not to play around with. The prophet is subject to the prophet. And in any case, it's not courtesy, it's not even good manners to go into a church and you're unknown and you're not even a member to monopolize the meeting. That's not fruit of the Spirit. You know them by the fruits. If that man had been gentle, kind, and just occasionally spoke, I wouldn't have said a word. But you can't have someone do that. Hmm. Now, you'll never build a church unless you have discipline. And you'll never build a church unless the pastor has the full control. The pastor's weak. I'm weak. So is any other pastor. We're only men. On the pulpit, God gives us a certain anointing, a certain thing, and people look up to us. And we have a certain standard. We know all that. But we're just weak. We're just men. We make mistakes. And people could say, I was wrong with that man, and maybe they were right. But I'll stand before God in the judgment for it. You see, I have a responsibility for that church. And so if I make a mistake, all right, I'll make many. But the blood will cleanse me, and God knows I've done it with a good heart. And unless you have somebody in control, it's chaos. Fancy an orchestra, all playing their own things, and the conductor stood there and let him. My goodness, he rack that down and say, you, sat. You play as I want you to play. And he's right. That's why you get beautiful music, and thousands of people are blessed. And you'll only get a church when people are obedient. We learn obedience to God by obedience to those above us. The scripture's full of it, even secular rulers. Be obedient to those over you. If they've got weaknesses, well, if, if you're not happy there, do it right. Tell them that you're leaving the church and go somewhere where you're happy. Or else go and start your own church. Praise the Lord. All in the gifts of the Spirit, this, all part of it. You've got to have that kind of discipline. So 
The spirits are subject to the prophets and you can control the gifts. You don't have to speak in tongues. You don't have to prophesy. However exercised you are, however emotional you feel, however wonderful the vision, you can control it. Believe me. And I'll tell you something. You'd be very wise, not when you're, like I said, sort of practicing. You've got to step out and just moving and get used to it. But once you get mature, and once you know you've got the gift, and once you know what it is you've received, and you know you can minister it, then you have control. The footballer that learns to dribble or learns the basic skills is pretty hopeless at first. The ball's all over the place. But when he really becomes skillful, he can move that ball on a sixpence. And then he's got complete control. Be no good on the field unless he had that control. And so you practice and, and so on. But once you've got the gifts and you know you've got them, then remember that you have a responsibility to God and to your church. And so you control the gift and bring it in at the best time. You know, I've known the time when I've had a gift and I've had it right at the beginning of the meeting. And I've waited right through the meeting until I felt was the appropriate time. Or else I've not given it. And you know, there's nothing to stop you if God gives it you again the next week to give it that week. And sometimes you find that the word is not for the church, but for you. And so the prophet is subject to the prophet. Well, I've been through that tonight, but you know, I never have enough time to, what, to say what I'd like to say. And I don't want to bore you. I want to bring something to you. But what I would like to do in perhaps the next meeting is learn to recognize or know how the gifts come to you, how they come through vision, through the Lord, through emotion, how they come. Because you can't really operate them if you don't know, can you? I remember when I was seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost and I knew you spoke in tongues. And I remember kneeling down for six months with Pastor Williams at the table. And I knew I had to speak in tongues. And I'd sit there and I'd kneel down and say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Ghost. And then I'd, oh, and I'd be like this. See, nothing ever came. Nothing ever came. And there came a day when I was filled with the Holy Ghost. And I spoke in other tongues. And so it's the same with the gifts. You've got to know how to operate. And you've got to know how they come. And you've got to be able to control them. And the church has got to have some discipline in the gifts of the Spirit. But if we can get this, then I believe the prayer meeting will be the best meeting in the whole of the week. And I believe that's the source of every blessing. Isn't it amazing that churches 200, 300 strong get 20 in a prayer meeting? Isn't that amazing? There's something wrong there, isn't there? Now, if we had 300 in the prayer meeting, we'd probably have 1,000 in the meeting at the night, not 300, because it would sort out the real ones, because the spirit would be there, conviction would be there. Not human words, but conviction. The Lord bless you. Thanks, Pastor.